Okay, welcome everybody to the Healing Connections podcast. I'm your host, Emmy Vadness. And today we are talking about yoga to heal the healer. And we are very blessed to have Betsy Shandalove with us today, who is an occupational therapist and is certified through the International Association of Yoga Therapists, which means that she has her thousand hours of yoga training. And she's also certified in Reiki. She has been an OT for 25 years and an integrative health practitioner for 10 years. Betsy teaches a six hour nationwide continuing education course to healthcare professionals on therapeutic yoga and integrative medicine and has been doing this since 2010. And is probably one of the first people uh, that I know of who's traveled across the country teaching yoga to healthcare professionals. She treats adults and children in a variety of healthcare and educational settings and is in private practice as well. So welcome, Betsy. Thank you so much for talking with us today. Thank you, Emmy. It's an honor to be with you. Ah, it's wonderful. We are both occupational therapists and um, yoga has certainly become a lot more popular in healthcare and you are one of the people who's helped make that happen. I'm just curious, how did you become interested in yoga, studying it, and then um, having now taught so many healthcare practitioners over the years? So I feel like it's definitely a, like a heartfelt journey. Uh, I uh, went to Boston University where I uh, got my OT um, license and certification. And when I was there, my junior year at, at happenstance took a yoga class and uh, it got my the best grades <laughs> that I could have gotten. And then cur currently, then I didn't really take it in as much, but I was much calmer um, in the city of Boston. Um, and then fast forward uh, a lot of years, and then I had each of my kids, I have uh, had three kids that I did yoga through the births of all of them. And then my middle daughter came along, and um, she's a sensory kid. And when she was about four or five years old, my husband and I felt like we were not able to parent her. I mean, we would go into public places, and she would lose it with the lights, with the sound, tags bothered her, all these different things. So we really felt like we were changing our family's lifestyle and we didn't feel like we had tools in the toolkit to parent her. So we went on, on a trip to Hawaii, to the island of Kauai. And I told my husband, please watch our kids for three mornings of our vacation. And I'm gonna go see all the healers on the island of Kauai. I actually had met and talked on the phone with an Ayurvedic practitioner before we left on our trip. And so she was one of the people of the three people that I met with. And after working with her for about four and a half hours, she said, have you ever considered being a yoga teacher? And I had never considered it, um, but took it in. And a synchronicity would literally have it a week later when I returned back to our town uh, outside of San Francisco, uh, an Iyengar yoga teacher training was starting. And people had waited a year to take this training, come to find out. And I literally walked in and the minute I sat in one of the training sessions, I thought this is OT. This is what I've been doing forever. And this is another tool in my toolkit. So I little did I know the journey that I would start on. Not only did yoga and has yoga transformed our entire family and helped my daughter, um, basically with um, calming techniques for us to learn to be able to help parent her and for her to learn those techniques. But then it's also transformed our town. So I began doing these classes, you know, in the school systems um, with, um, in, instead of doing the holiday party for kids, my kids, I would do yoga um, in that, that, that time in this time slot that um, other people may be doing another station. The point being is over time with teens in our area for the last 10 years, I've been teaching a teen class after school program. And so just a variety of, of things have changed. Um, I personally feel like I uh, feel transformed because I've learned to self-regulate my body and my mind. And then in turn, I feel like, um, I can pass it on to other people. And that's why I teach this course because I want to change healthcare. And so I feel like if we all as therapists learn to use this as another tool in our toolkit, not only can we transform ourselves and our nervous systems, but all of our patients as well. Wow, what, a, what an amazing story and how very in, intuitive of that practitioner in Kauai to share with you 
um, or ask you, have you ever considered being a yoga teacher? And that's really what a lot of your journey has been for all these years. I too, um, just to share briefly, I uh, have been practicing yoga for um, for a number of years myself, and my first real serious training program that I took was through a, a BKS Iyengar studio, a yoga studio. And uh, I like what you say about how uh, for occupational therapy, which is a broad field, which has um, you know many things that us that we as OTs can do. Um, but one of the main things that we do is we help people to be as functionally independent or interdependent as they can, whether that be that we help them recover or modify them or their environment. And I think that one of the things that I noticed as well with the training with Iyengar Yoga was how um, his use of modifications and props and, and so forth, which you know all about, uh, I was thinking the same thing. This is really phenomenal how, how uh, much we can modify the person for these poses. And, and, and you probably know more about this too than, than a lot of us, but my understanding is that BKS Iyengar was uh, uh, considered, I think he considered himself to be a, a, an unwell person for a number of years and that he says that yoga is what helped heal, them, heal him and that he was the first person to develop ways to adapt the poses and the posture so that people could, could do that more. Um, so, so you've done so much in these past number of years. Um, what, um, there's so much I wanna talk about, but just to kind of keep it to our, to our topic here, why do you feel that it's important or how can yoga heal the healer? So, uh, first of all, I think that it's interesting to start to think, you know, there are eight limbs in yoga. Um, and one of them are the niyamas. And one of the niyamas is called Svadhyaya. Svadhyaya. And, um, and what it means is, is self-reflection. And that's what's interesting to me about what yoga has personally done for me is to I, every day when I get up in the morning, um, I am self-reflecting and looking at my own body. How is my mind feeling? And I encourage this in my course to, you know, before I put my feet flat on the floor, I just kind of do a body scan. You know, how am I feeling today? And then when I decide to roll over and do a twist, which I encourage everybody to do five twists a day, it helps with digestion and stress. Um, but when I decide to put both feet on the floor, there's also a concept called um, where the right side of our body is energizing in yoga and the left side of the body is calming. So I decide, do I need it to be an energizing day that day? And I put my right foot down first. And if I need it to be a calming day, my left foot and then both feet down at the same time. So my point being is, is that the awareness of what's going on in my own body then can help me to be a better and intact and actually more acute observer of someone else. Uh, if I'm aware of my body, um, especially my own nervous system. I mean, I'm a big a proponent of you know, taking a lot of deep breaths before you start your day. Um, I meditate in the morning that's changed my life, um, even if it's just 10 minutes. So uh, that's what's, what I think is interesting is uh, to look at healing the healer um, and be a better observer as well. And so when you're observing yourself, you're also a better observer of your client. It's interesting because um, at my first job was at Duke Medical Center in North Carolina. It was a fast paced teaching hospital. And I know that I did not heal there. I, did, I really can't imagine as fast as I was going and as many patients as I was seeing, and with very little awareness of what was going on in my own body, I question how much healing I truly did. And it's interesting because uh, about uh, five years or, or six years ago, I was asked to come do my course at Duke. And they had not known that I'd worked there. So I actually sat, sat outside the hospital and watched the comings and goings of the people in healthcare there. And it was fascinating to see their heart rates. And I always ask the, our folks, like, as therapists, what is your heart rate like? What does it feel like where you work? Can you moderate your heart rate? Because if we can, then our patients can feel that and we can breathe together and the patient can be calm as well. Yeah. And when you say you're, uh, when you were initially working at Duke, you personally didn't feel that you were doing much healing or you felt like you weren't able to be as effective with the people you were working with? I look back, I look back on it now and I wonder as fast paced as it 
as it was and with my, no awareness of what my heart rate was like and what my nervous system was like, I, I now can look at it from a different lens. And I, the way I, you know, with healer, with healing, what I feel like is I put both my feet on the ground. I'm looking in the, at directly in the eyes of my patient. Many times I'm asking if it's okay to hold their hand. We take a deep breath together before we get started. So it's a very different greeting even than what I used to do. Right. Yeah. And that's something that I know you and I talked a little bit in preparation for this for today that uh, you and I have read stats that 50 to 80% of healthcare practitioners across the board have symptoms of burnout. Um, I know I've experienced burnout a couple of times in my uh, 20 some years now as a practitioner. And um, I think part of it might have been some of the settings weren't the right fit for me, but I think predominantly it's the, like you've, you've mentioned a few times about slowing down, it's the fast pace of those environments. And while yes, we, are, we went into these practices to serve others, um, at the end of the day, our current healthcare system is primarily for profit. And so in my experience, the productivity standards um, in most cases are, uh, the expectation of that is unrealistic and it causes people to feel like they are on a hamster wheel or through a meat grinder. Um, and so I, I've heard you mention a few times now about slowing down and, and can you say more about what yoga can do for a practitioner who might be um, either wanting to prevent burnout or who maybe is experiencing symptoms or what yoga can do in general to, you know, help, like you're saying, look, look at and be with their, themselves and their clients through a different lens? Yeah, so I mean, in a large part, it's that uh, you start your day with breathing and you're aware of your breath. So I mentioned that. The other thing too is, you know, uh, your movement patterns throughout the day. So I encourage people to, to do a twist while they're doing their paperwork, <laughs> you know? And the other thing too is body positioning. Yoga is really about, you know, what I like to say with yoga is it's about movement and breath. And it's also where are you not getting blood flow? And so many times I ask my patients um, and other therapists to check in with yourself. If we're seated all the time, we're not getting blood flow to our gut unless we do a twist, if we move there. The other thing that I encourage people to do, and this can be an interesting situation, but to put your legs up the wall or put your legs in a different position. So when I get home from you know, all of my treatments every single day, my family knows when I have my legs up the wall, I'm going to do it for five minutes and it's called Vipurita Karani. Um, so changing that body position for yourself and your patient. And also, you know, a lot about nutrition. I mean, um, yoga with these eight limbs is looking at how um, about non-harming what's called a hemsa. So the foods that we eat, are we drinking a lot of water? I know that's the age old thing, but really what food are we putting into our body um, to be able to give our bodies energy um, for us to heal and take care of ourselves? Because I think too many times with this fast paced, we're just quickly grabbing whatever we can. And so I'm realizing more and more um, yoga, if we go back to the Ayurvedic pieces of yoga, there are three doshas um, or constitutions. One of the things that I started realizing personally is that I was getting injured um, with knee, knee issues, in particular ankle issues, shoulder issues in the summer months when it was warm. And what I realized is it was all based on inflammation. And I realized now also that I had to change my entire diet in the summer months to be able to change and take that inflammation out so the foods that I was eating, as much as I love tomatoes, for me, they were very inflammatory. I'm pitta and vata. So the pitta is that inflammatory fire piece. And I would run. I was a runner. And I've stopped running in particular because that was just adding more of that pitta fire to my body. So what I encourage therapists to do is to find out what your constitution is. Um, when I lecture around the country, there's a great website that's really low, you know, doesn't cost any money and it takes very little time. And it's called banyanbotanicals.com. It's B-A-N-Y-A-N botanicals, B-O-T-A-N-I-C-A-L-S.com. And the reason why I like them is, is that they actually will tell you not only the percentage of your body type with your constitution, but also the types of foods to eat and what season to do it in. So I think it's interesting to start to think about what your body, own body constitution is and to teach your patients that. 
Those are great suggestions. Thank you for that. I really like what you say, and I've adopted this more in my lifestyle for the last several years as well, is starting out the day with how do I feel, um, even setting an intention for the day, or when you say what kind of day how, is it going to be? Do I feel like I need more energy? Do I feel like I need to be more calm? And um, I've really noticed that my days are different when I start out with a meditation practice, doing some yoga, postures, asanas, whatever other exercise I may do. I do some exercises in the morning and some in the late afternoon or evening. And then being able to you know, have that meditation or prayer, even if like you said, it's for 10 minutes that my days are, you know, they're noticeably different as far as how connected I am. And uh, there is a lot of power that we have in our own ability to uh, manifest in our lives. And if we can be more centered and that if our energy is more calm or integrated, that I, agree, I completely agree with you that how we then, um, our presence and how we are able to be with others and positively uh, affect or influence others can, can be different. So what are some other ways that you feel that yoga can help heal the healer? I know that uh, it's not uncommon for people to think of yoga or equate it solely with the physical postures or the asanas. And as you've already mentioned, there are eight limbs to yoga. What are some other ways that you feel it can help uh, practitioners in their practice or in their lives? So uh, certainly pranayama. I mean, that's the breath work. And I think it's interesting, there are calming breaths that we can do and energizing breaths. And so I incorporate a variety of that breath work throughout my day. Um, honestly, I start my day with alternate nostril breathing, where you literally close one nostril and breathe out completely and then switch and then breathe in and then breathe out and you go back and forth. And it's almost like a neti pot, like you're cleansing your sinuses. But what I really love with kids, and this is what I talk about anybody that has any cognitive disabilities or any adults that have that, is that it helps with it's, um, crossing midline and it's helping balance the brain. So that encouraged not only adults to do it, but kids to do it. And I personally do it every morning um, to, to calm, but also to clear um, your sinuses and, be, and prepare your, your body for the day. The other thing that I really think is interesting is um, you know, mindfulness and meditation because people are so distracted with devices. Uh, and so I find that, you know, being mindful of when I get up in the morning, you know, preparing my body like, um, I'll do water with lemon and um, help to cleanse my body that way and being mindful of, of putting that in before I have coffee or be ha before I have tea. And I encourage my patients to do that as well. And then mindfulness is also carrying into the school system. So uh, the mindful practices that I teach with kids, I work in two school systems and I'll see 28 kindergartners all at the same time. And we start with um, what's called take five. And so we take a deep breath in for a count of five and it's just, you know, very rudimentary of putting your fingers up. So you just take a deep breath in and breathe out. And I teach that to my patients and then the kids do it. And so whenever I can tell that they're getting a little out of hand or the teacher can see that, then the teacher can do it in the classroom. So we start to teach this work and then you start to do it throughout the day all the time. The other thing that's interesting about mindfulness and meditation is, is that it's whole body listening with children and with adults, like to look at our posture, you know, how tall can you sit up? and not fall into this kyphotic, you know, situation. Um, I'll, with adults, I'll do something called the over the back tie with, um, I take two men's ties together, but you can take a 10 foot long yoga strap and you literally put it under the arms and over the shoulders and crisscross it between the shoulder blades. And that actually helps to train the brain to sit right. In fact, I even encourage my adult clients to take that loop and belt it and they can sit at the computer in an absolute great posture. And the brain starts to get a sense of that. So they start to do it all the day, all, all throughout the day. With the breath work, there definitely is, you know, research that um, the, the brain goes into an alpha, more alpha uh, brainwave state and that re relaxation response state, which I, I know you're aware of, um, but just to kind of expound on that a little bit more. And that when we do take a slower exhalation, that we are helping with the blood gas exchanges and helping to release those toxins in the body 
and get uh, everything a little bit more equalized there so that we can think more clearly and function in a more homeostatic balance. You and I were at a retreat together. It's been a couple of years and you actually did the strap with me oh, that's um, right. with the shoulders, which, which was fantastic. Uh, and it really, it really is something that really does help you, you know, it gives you that proprioceptive, that, that physical um, input into your body and really does help get the shoulders back. And I really liked it too, because you had us, you looped it around and then, and then you had us strap it around, I believe around our rib cage or our, our weight. Well, I guess it was up at the rib cage, rib cage, not the waist. And, uh, and we, it really does help with that. So there's, so there are many things that we can do. And it, it did also, I mean, if we, you know, one of the things that I sometimes suggest to people is to imagine that they have a string gently pulling them upright at the top of their head. And even if we just do those, you know, like with this, with the strap or getting our posture that it really can shift. We literally get more oxygen into our lungs. We feel more energized and, and so forth. So I think those are all really great examples. Can you share a little bit of a, a story of an example of um, how you maybe have helped a child? I know you mentioned your own daughter. Um, and maybe if you could just take us through a little bit of what you've done. I know we're talking about yoga to, to heal the healer, um, but I think that, that as practitioners, that, you know, and, and certainly this is something that I've noticed in my life, is true in my life, that as I've studied different techniques, thinking that I'm learning them for helping others, it's also helped me, but it goes back and forth so that, so that in a certain way, well, in a lot of ways, I'm being healed while I'm helping others and, you know, and vice versa. So yeah, if you have any a story or two, I think that would be really nice to hear. So in addition to, uh, to start uh, the um, class, I also have a singing bowl. And I notice you have one in the back of your, um, behind you here. Um, and I have a giant one. And actually, it's funny because I have one, I have one here too. <laughs> oh, we could get ours to sing together. Yeah, we could. That's so awesome. Betsy, why do you like this? It's a vibratory sense that we're bringing into our body and our body is made up of um, vibration. That's truly how our body works. And so it's interesting to start to think about bringing vibration to the body. Uh, some people that need vibration desperately are somebody that has depression. And, um, or one of my adult patients, I know you're asking about kids and I'll go back to that in a minute. But oh, one of either my, is fine. Yeah. One of my adult patients that had osteogenesis and perfecta or fragile bones where literally you had to be very careful with any movement at all, loved the vibratory sense of the singing bowl. There's also a breath work called bee breath or bromery where you're literally making this sound in your body. And I'm going to just demonstrate it. You put your fingers at the crest of your nose and right above your lip and then right underneath. And then you're gonna take a deep breath in and you put your teeth together and you blow out a buzzing sound. So let's just try a deep breath in. That's kind of fun. And then close your ears because then it totally comes just into your body. Deep oh, like with in. your thumbs? Yeah, deep breath in. So somebody, and then it makes us smile because it's it makes fun. You smile, exactly. The other interesting thing is it's energizing. So it brings to somebody that can't move. It's lovely. The other thing about it is anybody that has pain, because the focus on breath honestly has helped heal almost every one of my pain clients, and they do this throughout the day. So a deep breath can help. That long exhalation, doubling the exhalation, brings on the relaxation response. But this breath actually energizes the body with very little movement. And so that's really important. So with kids, um, we start with the singing bowl, going back to them. And we, I have them close their eyes and make a wish before I do the singing bowl. That's so sweet. I love I am closing my eyes and doing the wish with them. And we take a deep breath in and blow out our wish. So it's a really long exhalation. Kids it, love it. And then the last thing we do before we even start, I do motor skills with these kids. The last thing that we do before we finish that 
is that we come into their body because so many times transitions for kids are really difficult and even adults. And so what I do, it's called palming. We rub our hands together as warm as we can. And then we gently put our palms on our eyes and you take a deep breath in and breathe out. Take another deep breath in and breathe out. And then you start tapping at the top of your head. And I say we're waking up our brain or bringing rain to our brain and then bringing our fingertips to our forehead, to our cheeks, to our chin and smile, and then to our neck and to our shoulders. So that now you're truly in your body, ideally. And you know, it goes back to tapping and a lot of sensory integration pieces, but I, that's the, before I start anything with a kid, a kid, that's what we do. And it really gets them in their body, they're ready, their whole body listening. And it's really interesting that putting the pressure on the eyes, any adult or child that has a hard time sleeping, I really recommend an eye pillow. And it's funny, I'm looking for mine because I always have it right um, by my bedside, but the weight of a one pound weight on the eyes actually brings on the relaxation response. In, in fact, the scientific uh, terminology around that is it initiates the vagus nerve, which is the second longest nerve in the body. And it brings re relaxation from everything to the heart, the lungs, um, the diaphragm, all the way down to the gut. And so I even tell people that if you're working with patients with gut issues, bringing on that relaxation response it can be really helpful. Not only sometimes to have an eye pillow at the eyes, but in treatment for those patients, I'll even put a sandbag on their belly if they can tolerate it because that's bringing blood flow to their gut and helping with that too. So it's interesting to start when you talked about using the Iyengar yoga, we're using props all the time in my, my treatment, no matter whether it's with kids or adults. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Yeah. And we now even know what the relaxation response, I mean, it's one thing because it's almost uh sadly normal that anxiety and depression is truly normal these days, meaning that it is in, in the norm. Um, but that, you know, certainly the relaxation response can help in those cases. And in a lot of those cases, being able to induce that um, for practitioners, right? Because burnout uh, symptoms can, can be the, similar to anxiety and depression and dealing with insomnia and so forth. But that the relaxation response also can heal all the way to the genetic level. And there's even evidence that it can uh, probably help prevent illness. And in a lot of cases, help certain illnesses recover. Um, and I know in my life, that's been one of the key components that has helped me through periods of trans great transition and stress, uh, times when I've been significantly burnt out. Um, and also it seems to be a strong fulcrum that I have noticed can also help with helping a person connect with their own inner wisdom and intuition, that when we can get into that calmer state, we're able to connect with our own inner knowing, which is, uh, isn't that samadhi in yoga? Yeah, it is, absolutely. Yeah, totally. You know, and I think it's interesting because once again, what I love about the work since I've been doing the integrative medicine for the last 10 years, I, I feel good throughout the day and I have more energy to be with my clients. And then we breathe together and it's a true interchange. And that's where the healing happens. When I can actually put my hands on someone's rib cage, I would have never thought to do that before I learned the yogic breathing, the pranayama. Now I physically take my fingers and really give them a real support around the rib cage and encourage them with my hands. This is how we want to breathe together. And when they feel that, it's, it's mind blowing really how much they can really change their breath pattern. Yeah, absolutely. And, and also as practitioners that if, if we're able to practice these techniques and we're talking about yoga today, if we're able to practice yoga, not only does it help us, I mean, it helps us. And then when we work with our clients and if we are in a clinical setting where we can, I think all healthcare practitioners can certainly recommend it if it does seem appropriate for the plan of care and the client is receptive to it, that then we can see greater outcomes with our clients, at least that's what I've noticed. And so then therefore that burnout or that um, our own personal development, if we want to call it healing, you know, becoming more whole, recognizing the wholeness within that's always there um, can heal more, don't yeah. you think? Absolutely. And the other thing to you know, think about is 
with yoga, and I haven't mentioned restorative yoga versus active, but I think it's really important to mention that and that especially with people with trauma have, that have had any trauma at all, having poses that are open to the room where their heart is open sometimes can really be off-putting and actually cause them to raise their heart rate versus a pose like child's pose where you're really in the fetal position um, and the person can come inward and breathe, can actually, maybe those folks, that's what they need. And sometimes I even physically go into child's pose in the middle of the day um, mm -hmm. to reconfigure my body and mind to really come inward. And then I come out of that pose after a minute or two or three, and I can go on with my day. And so I just think it's interesting to start to figure out what things work for you that you can do in a clinic setting, whether it's a take five, or physically going into a fetal position um, just to rest in child's pose. Yeah, one of the one of the postures, uh, poses, asanas, um, all really means the same thing, wouldn't you say, for the yoga asanas? Yes. Yeah, that uh, because, and you mentioned this earlier, uh, because so many of us do have poor posture because of devices, you know, our looking at devices, computers, phones, and so forth, that one uh, posture that I tend to suggest the most is the Tadasana. And I will have people stand against, I'm sure you do this too, stand against the wall with their, their whole backside, uh, getting their head back and getting their shoulders back in kind of that you know um, anatomical position with the palms forward. And I'll do that with them because I, you know, I need to model it, demonstrate it, and then they'll be against the wall, I'll be against the wall. And then we'll take some nice gentle breaths in and out and I'll have them imagine that their feet, that they've got equal distribution on all four corners of each foot. Um, and that, that, you know, we know from our background as OTs that that's really important, you know, neurologically. And, but, uh, but what I wanted to add about that is that when I'm giving those suggestions in my practice, I'm getting the benefits as a practitioner. I'm not doing, I'm not doing it for that reason, but that's something that I've noticed with, with yoga that you can do it with your client while you're instructing them. Have you found that to be true as well? Absolutely. Yeah. And also I think you start to realize, and this is where the humility comes in, that it's all about every, one day you can do well and another day you can't. And I think it's really interesting. You know, I used to work with people with spinal cord injuries that were really, um, you know, changed their whole life with these heavy duty spinal cord injuries. And I wish in a lot of ways that I had had these tools then um, going backward because um, they need to take on a whole nother view of their life because they were going to their body physically change and with yoga when you start to take that in and start to do an assessment what we're talking about you can actually you know it can move forward a lot easier when you start to realize I one day I can do something one day I can't our body does have limitations and I think it's important for for us to start to realize that as therapists I think sometimes we get in, in a, a routine and forget that this is really hard for somebody that's just had this disability um, and how to cope with that yeah and spinal cord injuries for those who may be listening um can often, and probably in the cases you're referencing, uh, mean paralysis, either you know somewhere below the neck or uh, along the, the spine down to the waist. Um, and there are yoga practitioners, and I'm sure this is what you teach when you teach your course across the country, is teaching healthcare practitioners how to bring in certain techniques for people who need to be using wheelchairs or who have other types of assistive devices they might use. Absolutely. I wish that uh, if I had my choice, if there's somebody could get, grant me one wish, I wish that there were more seated yoga classes around the country. Mm -hmm. I honestly believe every yoga studio should have at least one seated yoga class. And it's not even for people that would be in a wheelchair, that's for sure. But also for people, just some days you'd like to just sit and work um, from the waist up and to be able to not worry about you know, the extension with your legs and your ankles and your feet. Um, so a seated you know, class can be great. So that there's, you know, one of the things that I encourage everybody around the country is make videos of seated classes because more and more people want that for people with disabilities. And it's just important. I'm working on one now so that eventually people can actually, you know, we can see it. It's going to be second nature. Um, you know, a lot of times people will come to me and when I teach and they say, you know, I'm a physical therapist and I'm treating injury um, with yoga. And the, the person was in a yoga class and overdid it, and now they have a shoulder injury or a knee injury. 
And the interesting piece about that is, is that that's what I say to people, please look for a yoga teacher um, that you, first of all, talk to them about limitations first before you start the class. And a very good yoga teacher should adapt every pose so that somebody might do it one way and the person ne you're may being next to them, you may do it a different way. So it's really interesting to when we talk about healing, the healer is knowing what your limitations are and being honest with yourself um, mm -hmm. to not push yourself too far. Too uh, far. I, I in particular know as I'm aging, um, I have I'm changing my um, exercise pattern. And what is important to me is literally to actually calm whatever I can find now to keep my nervous system calm. That's what I would choose to do. Um, not as much of the cardio. Um, and I know everybody's different, but that's one of the things that yoga has done for me is just an awareness of my body and what it needs um, at a certain time of day as well. Yeah, absolutely. And not all of us finding, like you were saying, with our, the doshas of the constitution, what works for us and being able to um, understand ourselves. And, you know, and like you were saying, you know, different, different times in our lives, we might have different needs. We might want to be more energized, more calm. I also liked what you said about the, the seated yoga. Um, is that what you called it? Seated? Yes, seated. Uh -huh. Seated yoga? Because there's also yeah. chair yoga where you're well, yeah. it, it, it's like prop. basically the same. Yes. Yeah, but well, the, the chair yoga, I, I like that you say seated yoga because chair yoga, sometimes there are standing poses with it. And the, with the seated yoga, um, also with um, people who uh, maybe aren't using an assistive device, but um, they might be might have a little bit uh, mobility, some mobility issues, or maybe they use a cane or something like that. And it might, I mean, not that we can't still challenge the nervous system and the balance to do some standing poses um, as well, but I, I really, I really like what you're saying with that. Um, so what have you, can you share a little bit about how, what it has it been like for you to teach all these years going back and forth across the United States? You, you're meeting with all sorts of healthcare practitioners is there something you could share with us about what that's been like for you? Yes. Um, so I will tell you that um, if you choose this journey and if you've already cho chosen that you're going to be shaking your head, um, if we really truly start to think of ourselves as healers, which we are, I always say I'm holding onto a rope and I don't know where it's going because this work fell in, literally fell into my lap. I certainly opened up my mind and my body and my soul to find this work for my daughter. But in turn, the way I was asked to speak is literally I named my website Yoga OT. It's what I did. There was no one else really doing that work except for one yoga teach, uh, occupational therapist named Ann Buckley Reen. But other than that, I'm not sure. And if there are, I would love to talk to you. But the bottom line is, is that um, I, a company, a continuing education company contacted me and said, would you teach this class? And it's interesting how we start to think about our life story because I had written courses, six hour courses to teach at Shepherd Center, the Spinal Cord and Brain Injury Rehab Hospital. So that was an easy thing for me. So I guess my point being is what I've seen transform is I was nervous beyond belief the first couple years because I honestly didn't, there were very few people doing this and yoga as a word can be off-putting to people. And so what's interesting, and I will revisit that in a or minute. Or intriguing for somebody like or me. Or intriguing, yes. Yeah, depending on what maybe you've heard about it before, right. Right, um, or what's in the back of your mind, right? But my, well, I guess the main thing that I've seen in the last 10 years which is so exciting to me, which is why I never, I love the work I'm doing, is that 10 years ago when I would ask someone, in the entire audience of OTs and PTs, speech, massage therapy, how many of you are a yoga teacher or taking a yoga class? Very few people would raise their hands. Now, I would venture to tell you that not quite, I would say a third of the people actively do yoga, meditate, and are now yoga teachers. Currently or when you first started? No, now. So from 10, over the course of the 10 years, our healthcare industry, I believe, is more integrative. And so more and more people are doing this work. And they're coming to my course for a number of reasons. It used to be they were coming for the first time just to hear about it, I believe. Now they're coming because they want to get a day of healing for themselves which is what I like to promote in the class that you will experience. But in particular, people really are using it now as a tool in their toolkit 
to be able to help people. I always say that what's cool about yoga therapy is that when I used to give home exercise programs to my patients, um, they, I knew they weren't going to do it. They'd sign off saying they were going to do it, but they didn't. When we breathe and move like you do with yoga, and when you start to bring on even some of the transitional changes like meditation and mindfulness and your awareness of your body, what we find is, is that you want to do it. Your brain craves it. So that's really a fascination that I've had about the number of people now that are doing this work. And you know, you and I have talked about this before, but the biggest proponent of why this is happening is the National Institute of Health renamed in 2014, the name of, it was used to be the Center for Complementary and Alternative Medicine, and now it's the Center for Complementary and Integrative Health. And so that's changed. Now doctors can be trained um, in integrative medicine. And I, I, I I think that's part of it, but I also think people are searching out ways to keep their mind and body balanced. Yeah, I mean, it's also grassroots. I mean, a, a lot of people like you and I um, have been hungry for this and have sought it out. I mean, you know, you were looking for ways to help your family. Um, I was finding that I wanted more ways to help the people I was looking with, and I was at, uh, suffering from incredible stress myself, and so I started studying these holistic practices and so absolutely there's um it's interesting i think you and i were we're doing some of these things um early on and now it's starting to catch more which is which is great and i and i i am i am grateful that the the governmental office um has changed and gotten rid of the word alternative um even though those those terms are sometimes used because a lot of people as you and i have had discussions you know integrative health or integrative medicine uh if you're not in healthcare you probably don't know what that means um, but holistic or alternative, still people recognize those terms. But now that there's been more research around yoga and uh, these other integrative health practices that um, it's now being recognized that they're really not alternative any, anymore. And would you say, um, do you feel that yoga is uh, in the main, is, is now mainstream healthcare or is 50% um, in mainstream healthcare? Or how, what have you noticed as far as the practitioners you've been training or kind of how you've been seeing it used in facilities, do you think that it's, um, that it's uh, being a lot more commonly used or somewhat more commonly used in healthcare? I mean, I think it would be hard for me to put a statistic to it, but here's what I would say is more and more hospital systems are offering um, even yoga classes for stress relief for their employees. So, you know, for instance, Cleveland Clinic, um, there's a woman named Judy Barr there that um, a year, I guess it was three or four years ago, I went to the International Association of Yoga Therapists Con uh, Conference, and she spoke, and she has, they are just teaching class after class after class throughout the day at Cleveland Clinic for the people in healthcare. So that does a couple things. One is doctors are more aware of it. Um, that that could be, that can help their patients. And the other piece that goes along with that is the patient's sense that the person has, you know, feels calm, more calm. Um, and also then the, then the therapist can then translate that to their patients. And I think school systems right now are really talking about mindfulness and they want to hire mindful teachers um, I will tell you that I'm, I, in our small town of 17,000 people, um, for our school district superintendent and all of the district principals, I did a mindfulness and meditation um, two-hour session with them. Um, so it's really interesting to start to think about. You know, one of the things that is really so easy to do when we talk about heal the healer, and I think about that from uh, the CEO at a hospital all the way to the superintendent of a school system. And what one thing I think people need to start to do and think about is have a blanket in your office. Hmm. Either it's for you to literally wrap around you just to take a couple of deep breaths. It's like someone's hands are on their shoulders if it's a pretty you know, good weighted blanket. And I actually then in turn, or you would have it for an employee that comes in hey, would you like to put a blanket? You know, once again, we're coming back to that inner self of that innocent child that we all sometimes need to go back to. That can take, relieve so much stress for people or have blankets in your own home. In our house, we have every person's gone and picked their own weighted blanket that they like. If it's a lightweight, a medium weight, a heavy weight, 
And that's something that we encourage is that self-soothing with my, I have three teenage girls. So my point being is it's fascinating to start to think about how with small things like a blanket can really start to heal the healer. Mm, I love that. Yeah, and I'm in Minnesota and we're transitioning here into the autumn season. And um, I do have blankets here for my clients because sometimes they get cool or chill when they do go into a more relaxation state. Um, but I like that about that, having that comfort, that, that warmth, feeling cozy and that proprioceptive input. One thing that we, I'm just curious, I know it's really important for you and, and, and I agree, I mean, self-care is, is hugely important for us as practitioners, for those of us who have gone into healthcare because we want to help others. Um, I know I can speak for myself that for years I gave and gave and gave and uh, didn't take as good of care of myself as I, as I could have. And so yoga and some of these other practices have helped me to do that. Um, so what, uh, what other ways would you, or how would you define what a healer is? It's one thing we haven't really, or, you know, because I know that's really important for you to have the, because healthcare, we both know that healthcare is, I mean, there's a lot of beautiful things happening in healthcare. I don't want to sound like there isn't, but there, it's uh, in a lot of ways uh, a broken system. Yeah, so to me, a healer is, first of all, you come with compassion. Um, ideally, you have removed any um, of your um, negative thoughts um, so that you, have a, you are a clean, clear slate to work with your patient and you can meet them right where they are. So I always say like squaring up you know, looking the person in the eye, having both of your feet flat on the floor and looking at them. And like I mentioned earlier, holding their hands, but a healer is someone who really is in touch and observant and also not distracted. I do get a little, um, I wouldn't say frustrated, but I wonder how well we are healing if we've got a computer that we're working on to input documentation while our patient is sitting there. Mm -hmm. um, and not giving them your, their full attention. I know we've, this is, you know, will be debated, but um, I think that there's a way to do the documentation, but initially to be able to make that connect, true connection and say, how are you today? How are you right now? And I think that's the healer piece that is, is the listener. And it literally, if, and then I say, let's take a deep breath together. Because sometimes we can clear our mind and our head if we can, if we literally, if they know, the person knows that you are really with them right at that very second. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a really valid point. I mean, even um, just in my personal life, if I have my phone and I'm with my significant other, my husband, um, you know, and this, this happens to all sorts of people in relationships that can make the person you're with, if, if they're not part of what's happening, it can make them feel that they're not with you, even though they're in the same room with you. Um, I even, my, my dogs even seem to notice that sometimes. Um, oh, she's on her phone. <laughs> I mean, yeah, they might want to be pet, but but they, they can pick up on those subtle cues of where our attention is. And I know you and I became occupational therapists and healthcare practitioners at a time when we still did handwritten documentation and we, we didn't do documentation in the room with the, with the patient or the client. Um, and I think we were able to be more present. And so um, it would be interesting if we could, if we had some of, some of that sort of similar system and we were doing yoga as well. Um, but I know that that is something that is required in places to carry around. I mean, I even know some practitioners, they're carrying around a whole laptop, not just an, an iPad, but a whole laptop, um, which has to be not the most comfortable ergonomically for them either. Um, so how have some of the healthcare practitioners, the healers who you have been training, how do they respond? What have you noticed? What changes or shifts for them in those six hours that you are with them? What is their feedback to you? So what's, I will tell you, uh, I don't know about you, Emmy, but um, when I went to OT school, I wasn't told that I was a healer. Uh, you know, um, and I will tell you who is the profession and it seems consistent and that's massage therapists. Over and over again, if I have a massage therapist in the room, they will say, yes, I am a healer. I was told I was a healer in, in training. And what's interesting and the most fun discussion that I ever have in my entire course is when I ask people, how do you get rid of some of your patient's energy? 
And what I mean by that is we know that there are certain patients that before you even go in have, can be um, angered, toxic, that kind of thing. And so how are we getting rid of that? And whether they are, maybe they're just absolutely pleasant, but how do we transition to the next person? Mm -hmm. um, and not take the energy from that past client and bring it to the other clients. So I, around the room, I'll have them raise their hands and here are some of their responses. Um, I brush my arms from starting from my shoulders and I brush my hand all the way to the tips of my fingers and think about it leaving. And then I do my other arm and brush and leave. Another woman says that when I get up in the morning, I think of a bubble of light around me and nothing's going to, to break that or and puncture that. Or um, what I really love is the washing of the hands and with an intention. So we all have to wash our hands. But if we literally think about the energy from that past client going down the drain, then we can then start fresh when we take our paper towel or whatever, rub our hands together with that friction, then we can go on to the next client. So it's interesting to start to think about how we get rid of some of the energy uh, that we take on. The other thing I do, if I know I'm going to have a client that is this way, is I'll physically put a jacket on or a scarf around my neck or around my shoulders to protect my heart. Um, and I might keep not keep it on all day, or if you don't have that, I know some people wear lab coats, I kind of think they can just put their hands over their heart. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I'll have my hand over my heart and the mother hand on my patient's hand. So that you're doing both, you're making a connection with them and protecting your heart. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's beautiful. And that makes me think of some of the um, energy healing practices that I that I've studied and now teach is, um, and it's interesting when I've kind of looked into the history of yoga and uh, Qigong and other forms of energy healing, they seem to, they seem to uh, have similar roots and, uh, and, and almost um, at a certain point seem to be imperceptible from of one from the other in a certain regard. So as far as the feedback of what some of your um, healthcare practitioners say to you, um, do you have any, like, what, what do you tend to hear them say about um, what they like about it, what you're teaching them? Okay, so for sure, it is, um, I, I actually start the course by having them pretend that we're at a retreat center, and that they're leaving phys the physical space in their mind um, for the day. And so we start, um, you know, physically moving in the morning and then midday, um, we actually have almost everybody put their legs up the wall after lunch and do a restorative pose and a, a body scan so that throughout the day they're moving and breathing and feeling good. And at the end, it, I like to think that it's a motivational piece. Go out and do your work. You can leave my course and all you would, it would be another tool in your toolkit, just like NDT or PNF. You could leave my course and go become a yoga teacher if that truly is what you want. But for sure, every person can teach a seated yoga class mm -hmm. after my cl um, class. And so I, that's what I always want to leave people with are tools that they can use themselves for healing, but then also that they can use for their clients. The one thing that everybody wants to know is how do I charge for this? <laughs> you mean like bill? You mean like bill? How do I bill? Yes, for billing, for documentation. And what I say all the time is, Mo any breathing that we do um, is um, muscle re -ed. Mm -hmm. So we're really, you know, that's what we're really looking at. And so, and you know, the other piece, if we're trying, if we're working on an ADL and we're doing, um, I always give the example of warrior one, where you're standing and your arms are over your head and one leg's behind you and one knee is bent. That's just like physically getting a plate out of a cabinet. Mm -hmm. We're working on balance. Typically, I might even have the gait belt after. And just for those who might not know, ADL means activity of daily living, like putting your dishes away yes. in the morning or from your, from your dishwasher or having to reach up to get a plate from the cabinet to, for your meal. Yeah. So, so Warrior One not only opens the rib cage for better breathing, um, but you can physically have them work at a, a cabinet to get a plate down. They're working on balance with that one leg behind them and the one knee bent um, in front of them. They're squaring their hips. And then they're taking a deep breath in, really expanding their rib cage and then bringing that plate back down. Well, I would document that as an ADL, even though I'm using yoga and a yoga pose to get there. And I think that's what people are really not quite clear on. 
um, I, we're not in a place to document that we're using yoga uh, I, not yet, but we're close. Uh, some practitioners I know are using the word yoga, and I do encourage folks to, to do that. Um, but I know that some insurance companies might kick it back. So yeah, and you and I've talked a lot about you know if you I, the, I guess the point thing is if you know that you've got you've been able to get reimbursed for it and it hasn't been rejected use it please because the more that we can use that work the more we can transform the insurance company um, and I believe don't get me wrong I believe in the next ten years I'm just going to put it out there that we are going to see a very different I hope documentation system around that um, and that's my dream. And so I guess my point being is I just like for people to understand that your goals are still being met that you would document otherwise, but for pranayama and for, um, you know, any restorative poses, I usually use muscle riad because that's really what we're doing. Yeah. And when I, um, I created a course for the American Occupational Therapy Association on occupational therapy with complementary health approaches and integrative health. Um, if anybody's interested, it's still on their website as a webinar. Um, but I, in that, in the development of that course, I worked really closely with one of their education people, and we had a lot of discussions around billing uh, integrative health approaches. And we did come to the conclusion that yoga and meditation and other forms of um, qigong, tai chi can be an ADL in and of itself. And I know for me, it is an activity of daily living because it is a habit and a routine. And certainly we're using occupational therapy terms right now. There might be other uh, healthcare practitioners listening, um, but to look at it, that it isn't just a preparatory activity for, for them to go live your life. I mean, to me, um, when I look at the ultimate, um, in my opinion, uh, maybe I don't know if you would agree, but it seems to be the, the ultimate goal of yoga is that union aligning with the divine, the inner and the outer cosmos. Um, to me, that is a, something that has really increased in my life that I am able to be with that longer throughout my day. And I'm able to then have a, um, for lack of a better word, a more successful life. Um, more peace, more joy, my interactions, the richness, being able to enjoy each moment. I'm not always perfect with that for sure. I still have you know, more to develop in myself, but, but I'm just offering that I think that what yoga is really, um, at least from one of the perspectives I look at it anyway, is being able to, one of my um, Iyengar yoga teachers said, we do the asana so that we can then sit and commune with God. Now, whether you are a religious or spiritual person or not, but meaning that we can then sit in that silence and be peaceful. Mm. Yes. Be present, that our mind is calm, that then we can be in that state where we, um, really that state of no time and no time zone, I kind of think of it. So um, I just wanted to offer as far as, you know, I agree with you, Betsy, you and I, have, you know, we've, we have had and we'll have a lot more conversations around um, the evolution of these approaches because you and I and others are, are helping to bring this into healthcare. And, and some of us who, I mean, I kind of consider myself having one foot in and sort of one foot out, sort of, if you will, um, you know, that, that there are practitioners who aren't, quote, in mainstream, who are also, you know, people who are unlicensed healthcare practitioners who are practicing yoga and who are doing beautiful work. Maybe they've been, have had a practice for 20 or 30 years, or maybe just a year or two, and they're really benefiting people in a lot of ways. Um, we just have a few minutes left. I was curious, what is your ideal dream or vision for healers? Oh, that's a good one. Um, well, first of all, to keep, to every day be in discovery. Because I really believe that um, we're never done learning. And, um, and to keep uh, working on yourself, <laughs> you know, to, to keep learning as much as you can. Um, and, you know, it's been fascinating to me to um, the, the checking in with my own body and mind all the time. You know, there's a philosophy that said for yoga that says the first breath you take is the minute you're born and the last breath you take is the minute you die. And that is yoga. That's a pranayama. Um, and so I see it as a lifelong um, breathing, um, focus on our breath and knowing when and catching ourselves. I mean, I don't know if you've ever found yourself standing with another adult or child and your heart starts to race based on something they've said or what they've done. And, you know, I'm really trying to work better at slowing, even though that might happen, to slow my mind and my body down and breathe and send them love. Um, and I think more and more, if we can keep being, have an intention around that, um, we're going to have a, a much better and brighter world. 
Um, and then the other thing that I just want to mention is, is that my dream, just like there are coffee shops on every corner in the next 10 years, there will be meditation or mindfulness centers of quiet. Um, I'd like to think on every corner because I really do believe that um, technology is going to continue to flourish and there's lovely things about that. And we need quiet balance um, to, to center ourselves and, and keep our body whole. Um, the only thing I wanted to also add is a couple things that uh, I think are fascinating to look at. If you haven't ever um, looked at uh, Aviva Rom's work, it's, her name is A-V-I-V-A and it's R-O-M-M. -M. She's an integrative medicine physician that is doing so much about Heal the Healer. And um, right now she has a podcast literally on her website that's for free on this topic. And so I, it's, I really encourage people to look at that. Uh, and the other thing just to think about from a Heal the Heal Healer standpoint is um, I think in the next, um, hopefully I'll follow up with you and do a, you know, a two hour um, follow up on Heal the Healer, uh, a little more detail. And then also if you're interested in my course, um, if you go to Vine, V-Y-N-E, education, and put my name in, Betsy Shandalov, all of my courses will come up. And in the next two weeks, I have um, a live webcast that you can attend from anywhere in the country. So um, you can att attend my course, and you can even save it over time. So if you can't um, actually be there physically that day, you can pay for it, and then um, you can see it later on. So uh, I think it's really important for us to, as healers to keep to come, you know, come together. The last thing I would also add is if you haven't found other healers in your area to consider starting a meetup, you know, physically someplace where you can be with other people quarterly at least to talk and to sit and even do a meditation together, but talk about what your um, envision is with integrative medicine in your area. I think that that's really important. Those are great suggestions. Thank you for that. So you've already given some great, some great resources. Is there anything else you could um, share with practitioners who, um, obviously your course is a great way to begin. Um, you know, as far as like, you know, I think people might, usually when people think of yoga, they think of the postures, the, the asanas, which are very important. And if you do them, you are opening up the energy, you are strengthening and toning and elongating and getting the balance, getting the balance back in the body. Um, and then you can, you know, it's more easy then to sit and meditate and so forth. I think some people feel like they have to do it every day or, you know, I'm just wondering what kind of suggestions you tend to give people when they're first beginning with yoga as far as what kind of, um, how frequently to have their own self-practice? Yeah, that's a good question. And a lot of times people don't want to go to a yoga class. Um, there is a great website um, that I recommend, they've been around for a long time called Yoga Today, and it's outside. And they have three different ad adaptations for how to do poses. And I think that's interesting because you can also, if your hips are bothering you or your shoulders or your knees, you can actually look that up and they have a uh, yoga class surrounding a body part or heart opening or whatever you like. And you can do that in the comfort of your own home. Oh, and nice. the other, the, yeah, and the other thing that I would add is, is going to a yoga studio, even on the weekend and taking a two hour class that interests you. Most of the time they're $60 or $30 or something like that. You can take a whole two hour class on pranayama on the breathing. Um, yoga teachers, like you mentioned, some yoga teachers have had hours and hours of training, even though they may not have a, another certification, they really know their stuff. And so um, to think about attending one of those, also think about finding a yoga therapist or a yoga teacher in your area that you really could connect with. They could bring a yoga class to your hospital or to wherever you work and to have a connection with them, um, with the yoga studio, and then you would feel comfortable referring your patients to them. So I kind of see this as yoga as an extension of your treatment. Those are great suggestions. And one last question. Um, some folks um, might have concerns, or how do you handle it when people have concerns that yoga might not be in alignment with their religion or spiritual beliefs? What do you tend to uh, share or how do you um, how do you deal with that? Yeah, so uh, this goes back uh, the discussions that I remember having years ago uh, were in the school systems, and that was the first um, thought process that we had. And 
I got my training through the uh, through yogakids.com at the time, and um, they they were the first one of the first yoga training for kid for kids yoga teachers. And at the time, we uh, not only it was a year training, and we would have phone conversations um, and about what was going on in this different school systems. And in certain school systems, uh, because of religious regions, they were not around the country. They were not able to do yoga. And what we talked about is, why don't we call it movement and breath and not um, yoga? Um, it, to get it in the school system so the kids would actually have it as a tool. Um, and I, we all agree that the other thing too is um, namaste, which we say at the end of a yoga class typically. Um, I end in the school systems where I work um, that translates briefly to the light in me likes or resp respects the light in you. And so that's how I end my classes. Um, I can see yoga also is bringing the compassion to the world. And so it, without argument, about whether we should use the word or not, I try to find a way to have the compassion around and meet the person where they are from a spiritual sense. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting that when I end my classes for the school system, I say the light, may the light, uh, the light in me likes the light in you. We're all individuals and we're special on this work planet. And then the other thing that we say is we re put our hands on our heart. We make a heart with our hands or a diamond with our fingers, which is actually a mudra, which brings calming to the body in yoga. And they repeat after me, which I love, may I be happy, may I be healthy, and may I be helpful. Mm -hmm. And I believe that those three words um, and the movement and breath really embody what yoga is if we can't use that word. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and... Uh... And many folks I know just, it's just another uh, practice in their life that can coexist or I've seen a lot of people and myself included that it can enhance whatever spiritual or religious belief you have as well. Um, if you're open-minded and open-hearted enough to allow yoga to come into your life. Um, one last question I'm, I'm curious about is what have you noticed with the receptivity among medical doctors of yoga in your time of training? So it's interesting. Um, I, I've personally not had um, many instances where somebody has like referred, a doctor has referred somebody to me in, in part because I'm still um, actively working with my three teenagers and um, so I'm working part time basically. But I have on my trainings that I've done around the country, many times therapists will raise their hand and say a doctor wrote a script for yoga. Awesome. So that's encouraging to me, um, and very much so. And to um, piggyback on that, if you go to the American um, Association of Medical Students website, on the front that you can actually look up, they have a whole section on Heal the Healer, and many medical schools now are offering yoga, you know, Tai Chi, um, all these different forms of meditation, relaxation, to, and as part of med school to basically incorporate that into the, for their med students. And what I love is when I went um, and looked at this website not too long ago, um, they have four things that the medical students have to ask themselves. What is their own nutrition? So what is the doctor's self-care? And we can ask this of ourselves. What is our um, spirituality, if we have any? What is your value system? Um, what is your body saying to you right now? And then the final piece, I think, um, was, do you meditate? How do you quiet your mind? So it's really interesting. They have a whole survey that they answer around that. And um, I think it's interesting for us to ask ourselves, and you can check, check, it, check it too if you're interested as a healthcare professional or a yoga teacher. That's fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Betsy, for your time today and for all that you've, the gifts that you've brought to so many uh, healthcare practitioners, to healers, to reminding us all that we are healers. Thank and, you so much. And uh, anything else you would like to add or um, if you could also just mention how people, I know you mentioned Vine Education or Vine.com. Is that the website? Yes. So and, Vine, V-Y-N-E. Okay. Uh, dot com. And um, they're the education company. They used to be uh, cross country and Vine came together. So if you're familiar with cross country education, they're now one and that's fine. So they can put my name in, in the search box and then you'll see all of my courses that you can take. 
And then also, once again, I'm hoping to um, follow up with another uh, two hour Heal the Healer course um, through you. Yes, I'm excited for that. And, uh, and then thank you so much for your time. And I'm just wondering if maybe we could, um, we could finish with a namaste and uh, we could get our bowls going here. <laughs> yeah, hang on, hang on one second. I also want to just personally, and anybody that's watching, congratulate Emmy for um, bringing so many people together. This work will not happen and make change on this planet if there were not people like you. So I, from the bottom of my heart, want to thank you for bringing all of these people together. And this is how we're going to change healthcare, is are people like you that are inspiring others to speak their truth and to feel good about the work they're doing. So thank you so very much. Oh my gosh, Betsy, that warms my heart, brings tears to my eyes, and I could say the same about you. And I would also like to say, the light in me lo loves the light in you. And um, I say like, likes the light, I, I love the light in you. <laughs> okay, here we go, you ready? Yep. Now let's take a deep breath in and make a wish, ready? Thank so you, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Blessings, everyone. See you next time. <laughs>